You're listening to the Let Him Cook podcast, fueled by Cody Road and the Wild Rose Casino Studios. Nigel, we're off of a, a Super Bowl Sunday, the Super Bowl Monday hangover. Um, I feel like this is kind of the last weekend that basketball takes the back burner. Yeah. Um, from here out, it's kind of like just college basketball galore from here until early April. So uh, happy to be in basketball season. We're going to talk about the Super Bowl a little bit later, but I know we've had disagreements on, on food. So I'm going to need you to give me your best uh, Super Bowl appetizer, Super Bowl go-to. What, what are you cooking for Sunday? I was asked this last night, and my quest, my answer remains the same. Uh, buffalo chicken dip okay. or just uh, a good – you know, I'm, I'm a Mexican at the end of the day, so I love a good authentic guacamole. Yeah. So. I, I'm with you on both of those. Those are probably yeah. two of my favorites. I also just like buffalo wings straight yeah. up. Just like any, any way I can get buffalo wings – I'm it. I don't know what the the uh, if I'm gonna go for a meat, I would say either wings or what are those little tiny hot dogs? Yeah, uh, uh, they're not pigs in a blanket, but they're like the ones you kind of like wrapped in like in barbecue sauce. Yeah, like and you just like cook in the crock pot. We call them Smokies. I don't. There might be a more official name for them, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, those are pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Also, pretty good. Iowa State this week, and we're going to get into it a little bit later, but right on the edge, I think, of of top 10 once the AP poll releases in about two, three hours. So first, let's get into it about Texas, and I want to start this, Nigel. Wait, 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 before we we do. Yeah. One moment. Oh, we're going to put on hold here. Maybe getting a horns down sign. Oh, the cowboy hat. How about them long horns, baby? Oh, Tyrese yeah. Hunter sucks. Uh, anyway, go on. Feels good to say that. Uh, Longhorn Network. What the shit, man? Um, I just hate that thing so much. Yeah, uh, it's bad. I have ESPN Plus. I have YouTube TV. Thanks to Nigel, I have Peacock. Longhorn Network is like the last frontier of streaming hell that just nobody is willing to cross. Um, so happy that Iowa State will never be on that network again. It was a stupid thing in the beginning. It's still stupid now. Uh, so I want to shout out John Walters and Eric Heft. I truly feel so lucky as an Iowa State fan to have two great radio commentators for every Iowa State football and Iowa State men's basketball game because they just knock it out of the park. I can watch a game without actually watching the game. So shout out to them. But a, a really good game, um, and I want to start with the defense. In the first half, Texas scored 19 points total, and Max Abesmus and your boy, Tyrese Hunter, combined for zero points in that first half. What is – I mean, there's an obvious kind of beef with Texas, but what do you think it was that just had the Cyclones come out like dogs in that first half? I think – Despite us getting our lick back last last year at Hilton against Tyrese, I think something that was a, a pretty you know consistent crutch for Iowa State was playing in Austin. We always played really bad, yeah. And a lot of it was due to either we were it was still a Steve Prome led you know offense and program, or it was just a offensive limited TJ team at the end of the day. So I mean. I just feel like with this being one of our more complete teams, with this being a team that a lot of people are talking about as a, as a title contender, you know, at the end of the day, I feel like if anyone is going to play well in Austin, it's this group. And, you know, they proved us right. Um, despite, you know, maybe letting up the lead that they kind of built, um, still just yeah. making big plays when they needed to. So I think it was, overall it was a great game. Dylan DeSue and I, when Texas, I think they played Penn State in the game I'm thinking of. Uh, where Dylan DeSue looked like he had patented this like 10 foot floater. He made, I, he had to have had over 30 points in that game. He had 28 and 10, I believe. Okay. I mean, but he was just on one, like they couldn't stop him. And similar to Iowa state in that second half, especially looked like Iowa state just didn't have an answer for him. Um, now I was going to talk about this a little later and I want to lead this with, a win at Texas is a huge deal. Like you said, haven't won there since 2015. I think like Miles Turner might have been on that team. Like I don't even know what yeah. 
big guy or Jared bad. Allen. I mean, it's been a while. It was one of those two, Jared right. Allen or Miles Turner. Um, but I will say the and I know we were in foul trouble. I think Trey King had four fouls down the stretch. But I think Robert Jones on Dylan DeSue was a matchup that Texas was willing to kind of go after in the final 10 minutes of that game. And I would have liked to see TJ get a sub in. Like, I just don't think that's a great matchup for Rob. I think DeSue is very – he's just versatile. I think he's a little yeah. too versatile for Rob Jones to – like, Rob does fine in doses on the perimeter – but like that mid range that Dassault can kind of expose, and he can he can stretch out the floor. He can back you down. He's just a very talented player. And I yeah. think Rob Jones kind of got the brunt of it. Who do you would you like to see an adjustment? Would you like? I know. I mean, Rob Jones has been a staple for this program for three years. So I also get just leaning on your guys that have been there. Would you have yeah. liked a different matchup on Dassault down the stretch, or are you fine riding with Rob Jones? Um, if I'm gonna make an adjustment, I'd probably try out uh, Hassan. But I mean, other than yeah. that, Rob has been, you know, increasingly better this year at guarding the perimeter in spurts. But again, it's in spurts. And when a guy yeah. like Basu kind of has guard skills at the end of the day, and then also can shoot it, and then gets hot from shooting it, I mean, you kind of got to make adjustments. But I mean, if and that, but I feel like that's if you know. We go on our run. Texas goes on their run, and then they, Texas takes a lead and a convincing lead at that. That that's when you probably have to make an adjustment. But I mean, TJ and his staff they rode out with Rob, and you know that was that was a decision they made, and they still came out with a win. So I mean, I can't be too mad at that. Right. But nonetheless, you know, Dylan Dessou is a is a crazy good player, and I have the funniest Dylan Dessou story from last year when he was in the tournament. I was interviewing him, and he had had like twenty seven points against Penn State. Yeah, and same similar you know game as today. Like you just kind of hitting a lot of fadeaway jump shots at his size, and then also just stretching the floor and taking guys one on one from the perimeter just to the basket because you know people can't keep up with him. And I was like, "What kind of had you going?" He, he, they were going to him like for clutch buckets. He just kept hitting, yeah. hitting, hitting. And I was like, "What had you like you know feeling yourself to giving you the confidence to take like take those last uh the crunch time shots?" And he was like, "You know, I've always just kind of." been this kind of guy um i i hope my feel like i'm pretty nimble from playing football the guy played football at his size and he said he said that back in the day he's from texas so obviously big football culture down there but he right. said um that his teammates used to call him the, the nigerian warrior and literally at the same time marcus carr and who is who is it uh who's alan what was his name his first name i'm not sure i got you here I think it was Chris. Okay. And you, they're like at the same time, they're like, ain't nobody call you that, man. And it, it, was, just, <laughs> it, was, just it was just a it was just a funny interaction. I, I was oh. just glad to have gotten it on tape, but a self-given anyway. nickname. Yeah. But the Nigerian warrior. We were getting cooked by the Nigerian warrior. Right. Uh but he, nonetheless. He was going to war. Yeah, we, we came out with the win and a win in Austin is it, it's sentimental because oh. it's like our last yeah, our last two times, you know, playing him at home and playing him on the road. I mean, we yes, we come out with the win, but it's like I kind of want to keep beating him, and it it, it sucks that we're not gonna. A part of me is kind of sad that Texas is leaving, but only because you want to keep beating him. Right. I think Iowa State, like the men's Twitter, said like chapter closed or something. And yeah, the only if the only time we'll be able to see Texas again is either in Kansas City in the Big Twelve tournament or the unlikely scenario that we play them in March Madness. So that yeah. very well could be the last time, at least for the foreseeable future, that Iowa State plays Texas in a basketball game. Um, unless there was like a Big 12 SEC challenge, like it would be a non-conference game, which is just kind of crazy to think about. Um, Rodney Terry, at least for me, has drawn some ire. I'm just not a huge fan of him. I think he's a little corny. I think he kind of – fell upwards into the job at Texas. I think if Texas would have had a full off season to look at coaching candidates, probably taking someone else, but just the fact that he was an interim head coach, they won under him that first year. I feel like they kind of felt the pressure of like, I mean, he won. So you kind of got to give him the job. Um, didn't foul with 35 seconds left down three. And I know, like, every coach is kind of different. It's the same thing. Like, you know, do you foul down three with 10 seconds left? 
or up three, I should say. Um, but that didn't make a lot of sense to me. I like, I like you can trust your defense, but I think just draw the game out as long as you can. And that has been a pretty successful strategy across the board. Like you got a foul, hope they miss. And Iowa State, you know, maybe besides when we play TCU, a pretty bad free throw shooting team. Yeah. So if Taman Lipsy or Rob Jones has the ball, you should almost like hack a shack that you would think as a coach. Do you understand that by Rodney Terry not to foul uh, down three? I think, um, uh, I mean, f- personally, no, but I think from a perspective of maybe he doesn't have the biggest faith. Because think about this I know we're looked at as a bad free throw shooting team, probably on paper from a lot of teams. So you got to think, say, for whatever reason, we do make those two free throws. Say they do foul, we make those two free throws. This Texas has now done five. You have to kind of almost guarantee a three is going to be made. And then at that point, just to keep the game close and, you know, within 30 seconds, you know, just keeping it close, you want to be able to still with make it worth the foul as, instead of just running up the score. So yeah. you almost want to guarantee someone's going to hit that shot. And I don't know if, you know, Abrams can get off a shot that quickly. And I don't know if that's even in Tyrese's game to just hit, you know, in transition, pull up threes. I, I haven't seen them hit shots like that. Even in crunch time against Baylor, I mean, Tyrese Hunter was still going to the rack. So I – I just don't think he probably had the faith in the perimeter shooting outside of uh, who, Brock Cunningham. Is that his name? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, that dude was born in 1998 and he's still playing college basketball. Buddy, go hit up indeed. The job, the job force needs you. All right. You become a union worker or something because it's over. Anywho. <laughs> Outside of Abrams and Cunningham, I don't know who's hitting that three to keep the game right. close. So I probably it's probably why he didn't want to foul. But what were you gonna say? As someone who graduated like at the height of the pandemic in 2020, I get staying in school next year playing basketball. The job market's fine, man. Yeah, go go sell used cars in in yeah. Austin or Fort Worth. Someone will hire you. And that's how I feel about a lot of these dudes. I'm like, how the hell? Joe Toussaint's another one. That guy was playing basketball, I think, when I was in middle school, and he's still like well, playing. He's my age, but thanks. Oh, well, it feels like, <laughs> I mean, he's been on three different teams, and all of those teams have played Iowa State. And I'm like, dude, yeah, go somewhere yeah. else. I mean, I, I, it bothers me more so with like the people, the people who are. So I was born in 2001, but like I'm the my class is the 2000 kids and 2001 kids. People who are taking advantage of this extra COVID year and it's because they already played four full years of college basketball, go at it. But the second I see 1998 and then when I go to Google your name, I see 25 years old. Gross. I mean, my guy, this is sad. You're pushing 30. Get out of your uniform and go get a job application. Yep. I hear you. we we got like 32 Perry Ellis's right now in college basketball. It's gross. Yeah, it is nuts. And also, it's not even like – like a lot of times it's guys that stay for four years because their game just isn't built for the NBA. Yeah. Now it's just kind of – it's just like role players that have been playing college basketball for like seven years. It's like, yeah. dude, the same I it. Fear, I fear KJ Adams might fall into the same category. Right. Of just like, like a guy that won't five years. translate. Yeah. And then he's going to have to go, like like I said before, I've said this in a few episodes, but he's going to have to probably become like a tight end, like in a NFL practice squad just because yeah. of his stature. But, yeah, it's it's ridiculous, man. Like, I, I COVID has given the Big 12 so many glue guys, and I'm sick of it. Yeah. And we're almost done. I think what, like, is this kind of the last hurrah for the COVID year? Is this season or is it next season? I would hope because everyone from the if you were if you were affected by any way or fashion of COVID, I think the oldest you can be is like class. You graduated high school in class of 2016. So you graduated college in class of 2020. I think those are like 97, 98 kids. Right. So I think this has to be the last year of it. Like being you seeing 25 year olds that didn't go through drastic injuries and red shirts right. staying in the uh and staying in college basketball. So I hope this is it. But man, I mean, if 
if you told me it was going to take an extra four years to like completely wipe out that generation of college athletes, I wouldn't have believed you. I'd be like, these people didn't get a job offer in Austin as progressive as a city as that is. There's no openings. Brock? Know, like the, the biggest booming city in America and they can't, they can't find it. They're just still playing college basketball. You just, you just still want to show up to, to film session, huh? You just love the game that much. Ridiculous, man. Student athletes. All right. We got the AP poll. I kind of mentioned this earlier. Um, it is kind of unfortunate. We record Monday mornings and the AP poll comes out, I think like noon or one on Mondays. So we never really know, but I want to present a case that Iowa state should be top 10. And I think by top 10, I mean 10. So if you look at the AP where it is now, we got Iowa state at 14, Baylor at 13, Auburn at 12, Wisconsin at 11, Illinois at 10. Iowa State went 2 and 0 obviously. Baylor just lost. lost. Right? Baylor lost at Kansas. Auburn got blown out at Florida 81 to 65. Wisconsin's just terrible. Have you watched any Wisconsin basketball? I could go off I saw the last minutes. final score and I was like, "Ooh, we got some frauds." Oh we, my god. Someone's on fraud alert. For those that don't know, I have kind of my own metric system that I get cooking like in February and March called the DPI, which is just No, a- we need a segment on the DPI after this. After we're done talking okay. about rankings, I need I need you to tell the audience what the DPI is cuz I found it genuinely fascinating when I met you. But go ahead. Just quickly, in the DPI, Wisconsin is like an 11 seed. Like where they are right now projected, there should be an 11 seed and they're ranked 11th. Yeah. What are we doing? The Big Ten just – I hate them. I, I think they're just fraudulent. Yeah. I don't know. And Illinois, the same thing, lost to an unranked Michigan State. And Michigan State is one of the only teams that does well analytically. Yeah. That being said, the one, two, three, four teams in front of Iowa State all lost at least once this week. And Iowa State went 2-0. and I think Baylor could stay in front of Iowa State because, one, Baylor beat Iowa State. And Barely. I know, I know. Barely. By a tenth of a <laughs> second. Um, and then losing at Kansas by three points is about as close to a non-loss as there is in basketball. We beat Kansas, though. We did. And so. Houston. So that, like, yeah, the AP is going to have to make a decision. I Has Baylor be- played Houston yet? I don't know off the top of my head. Let me check. Aiden, could you check that for us? If possible, they have not. They have not. Okay. They play at home against Houston February 24th, and they only play them once. Of course. So, honestly, kind of rooting for Baylor in that game. Um, I, I was rooting for Baylor against Kansas, but then I realized them losing helps us out. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe this happened for the best. But, I think from here on out, we want Kansas and Houston to lose as much as possible. Yeah. Because I don't really, as long as Iowa State takes care of business, I don't really think any teams below them can kind of leapfrog Iowa State. Well, I thought we were, if we're not in third place right now. We're technically in second. We're a half game behind Houston. We're the only remaining three-loss team with Houston. Kansas has lost four times, and then so has Baylor and Texas Tech. And Houston's 8-3, and we're 7-3. and Like, you beat the first-place team, and you're not in first place. Yep. Yep. A game and a half. What even is that? What like what is that? That uh, yeah, I don't know. And also, I think Iowa State. No, there are a couple teams that have only played ten games. So I lied. Yeah, that's I the problem. Like, no one plays consistent games every week. Like no one. Right. Like everyone should just get two games a week. I, I think like that's would... kind of another casualty of the round robin. Uh, that we don't do round robin anymore. So it's not yeah. like every team plays two games every week. Because yeah, now it is all disjointed. Some teams have played ten games. Some teams have played eleven games. So you'll see like two and a half games back in the Big 12 standings, and that's annoying, but whatever. But yeah, so, uh, coming in, c- coming from your statement about where you think we'll end up, what, what's the number that you're thinking? I think 10. I, I could see us be – I wouldn't be mad if we're 11th and Baylor is 10. Um, but honestly, if they have any of those other teams in front of Iowa State still, if they have Auburn, Wisconsin, or Illinois in front of Iowa State, that will – irk me a little just because i think iowa state went two and oh and all three of those teams had bad losses wisconsin yeah. had a couple i think i think it's gonna be nine but i think the ap poll 
is going to put us at 11 as well. Just because yeah. I don't think they like us, man. Like, I don't know. The second, like, I don't know, man. The disrespect and the, the kind of eye roll the, the college basketball community gives us when it comes to being in the conversation of genuine contenders is really annoying because it's like we're constantly getting treated like a little brother. And I feel like it's going to take like a final four or a national championship to shut all that down. Cause until that happens, you're just Iowa state, the Cinderella story yeah. every year. And it's, it's like, man, I, it's just disrespectful. Cause like you got Milan who's a freshman playing his ass off all year. You got a bunch of transfers coming in, in this first big conference environment, um, just power five environment really. And, you know, they're not getting their flowers half the time, or if they are, it's still just, I always feel kind of jaded when, you know, we win big games and we still don't get the ranking that I personally think we deserve and that other teams get the benefit of the doubt for like not getting that impressive of wins. But I, bro, you go, I don't care where you play them. You play Houston or Kansas and you beat them convincingly. I like, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt, especially after a week like this, all those, all those teams lost, man. If that's the case, we got a we got a Big Ten Midwest bias going on in the AP voting poll, and that needs to be investigated because it's ridiculous. I think Wisconsin especially, I think you just hear Wisconsin basketball and a certain image comes to your head of like, oh, yeah, they like – Yeah, Kaminsky and Decker right. and they're Final like, oh, Four. They were Final Four team. They have a good program up in Wisconsin. Dude, they're bad. They're not good yeah. this year. Um, Iowa State – yeah, they they're top ten in Ken Palm Net and BPI, and I feel even worse for my my Mormon brethren out in out in Utah BYU getting kind of worked by the AP poll as well. They're another team that's top ten in Ken Palm BPI Net, twenty first in the AP. I don't and, feel bad for anyone living in Utah, but for- <laughs> uh, but I think especially early in the season there was the eye rolling you're talking about. People are saying like Iowa State and BYU, they're playing the system like they're beating bad teams by 40 just to get a better net ranking. It's like, yeah, we're beating teams by 40 because we're that much better than like. Every and I feel team. like we have to play these shitty teams because everyone gives us the eye roll. It's a waste of time. So it's like, right. buddy, pull up to Hilton Coliseum. Yeah. 14 and 0 for a reason at Hilton. And with yeah. that, let's get into TCU. And I feel like I have discussed certain teams that would be bad matchups for Iowa State come March. And TCU is the opposite of that. If we could play six teams like TCU in the tournament, and TCU is not a bad team. Like, I'm not saying they're a bad team. Natty. (laughs) But the way they play and the players they have just play right into Iowa State's hands. Yeah. Um, and I think we saw it kind of the whole game. Iowa State shot 24 for 48 from the field. That's 50% from the field. Just total shots attempted. That's nuts. Yeah. Um, and then 15 from 18 from the free throw line, which blew me away. I was ready to get on this podcast today and just be like, enough is enough. I want every Iowa State player to shoot 200 free throws before they leave practice. TJ might have already had him do it because they went 15 for 18 against TCU. And I'm yeah. sure shooting free throws at home helps, but that is an impressive number as a team, 15 for 18. I was very pleased with that. Is there anything from TCU that you took away as like, that's what I wanted to see? Um, Just, you know, I feel like outside of, you know, points I've made before about, you know, Keyshawn and just good guard play, I I just like, you know, obviously just the tone they're able to set every game. Like, I feel like, the heartbeat is them, the the backcourt of Jones, um, Lipsy, and and uh, Gilbert. You know, just starting, but also start looking back at you know just overall. Just we're getting better overall team wins now. Yeah, and I feel like it's it's doing us justice because it it, it kind of makes us unpredictable as we're not as one dimensional as we were in previous years where you know where the ball's going. You know what to expect. I feel like we can kind of hurt you from all different kinds of angles now. And it's showing. And also, too, coming into Texas, I saw that, you know, TJ talked to – he he told the media that he had talked to Taman about, you know, he wasn't happy with, you know, how he had been playing recently. And he said, I'm going to challenge you to, you know, try to, Im- like, improve. I want you to improve. I want you – you're not playing your standard of basketball. 
and the standard I know you're capable of. And it was just really cool to see Taman respond in a week like this because it was a big week at the end of the day. I mean, it's very easy to drop the second game you play any Big 12 team, especially after you win the first one, especially at home. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I just think it was a good overall win, and I just – I'm I'm happy with you know just the cohesiveness and like the the team overall good team wins because it's like it, that just gives you more confidence going into the Big Twelve tournament March etc. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I want to rewind a little bit because I wrote this down and forgot to bring it up, so that's my bad. But Lipsy had a great game against Texas, almost like a storybook kind of. Just because, you know, the old point guard versus the point guard we have now, the kind of yeah. weird tension like you kind of spoke to. And just outplayed Taman or outplayed Tyrese Hunter basically the whole game. Had a clutch mm-hmm. three at the end. And then when Rodney Terry chose not to foul, ended in a Taman Lipsy assist to Trey King for a dunk. And kind of that didn't seal the game, but it certainly felt like unless we royally messed something up, like yeah. broke. Um, so yeah, I mean Lipsy played his ass off against Texas. And I think you're right. And some of that could have been like a lingering injury. I don't know if he was like fully 100 percent right when he came back. Um, looked really good against Texas, was in a little bit of foul trouble against TCU, kind of had two early fouls. The other thing I want to talk about the TCU game, the team defense, man. There were like certain possessions where TCU had to just throw up a bad shot with like two seconds left on the shot clock because they didn't have a good look for 28 seconds. So you just have to throw up nothing because you you, you weren't given anything. And And I think two just like – that first half was crazy. Like you bring up the the stops they're getting. Like I forgot the specific run. Hold up, my my computer's tweaking. I forgot the specific run, but it. I just I thought of the song "Locked Up" by Akon. Like they TCU didn't know what to do. They yeah. They looked they looked clueless out there at times. And like to be able to set the tone that early, Hilton Magic might be stronger this year than it ever was. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Uh, I think I know it was when TCU was stuck at they were stuck at eight points for a long time, and I don't remember the exact amount of minutes that passed where they didn't get a basket. But early in that first half, Texas. Oh, we got it. Again, TCU scored twenty-two points in the first half. Texas scored nineteen. Like, I mean, when you're only scoring, and both those teams played better in the second half, almost out of necessity. It's hard to play worse than 20 points and a half yeah so i mean just being able to give like to get off to that good of a start and i know we've talked about this team blowing leads but as long and like we were up 10 to 12 points almost that whole time in the second half like it never really felt like tcu i think they got it down to six at one point and then iowa state kind of pulled away again and kept them at arm's length so i always talk about keep it a two possession game Keep it at five points. Keep it at four points. If you had a 17-point lead, I don't care if we're only up five. Just don't let them get back to one possession. I think Texas, for a moment, it was like a single possession game. But besides that, Iowa State has done a pretty good job in these last two games of, you know, the lead doesn't stay the whole game, but it never becomes scary, I guess. Yeah, and I think that's – if you're I I get it's hard to be – if you're already a team that's like constantly – letting runs go away um i think you just have to be able to weather the storm as opposed to once it gets to that two possession game let's just be better at clock management let's be smarter in our execution of not necessarily thinking we have to score we have to score but let's just try to kill some clock because it just puts more pressure on tcu to have to hit a big three or hit a big shot as opposed to just getting to the rack. Cause a lot of the, a lot of the ways teams are hurting us in getting back to the rim. I mean, excuse me, and getting back into the game is just driving the ball like really hard and aggressively. And it just puts us, you know, kind of at a disadvantage sometimes. And I think the second teams do figure that out. I think Iowa state, the more you see it, the more you anticipate it. So it's like, now you kind of know what's coming. Even if you can't stop it, you know how to kind of, like I said, weather the storm on offense. And I feel like that's what they did against TCU. And I think any team that has kind of taken advantage of, you know, a lead that you built like a Baylor, I think you just have to be able to weather that storm because it's 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 less of – it's more of 
that as opposed to, oh, we, we let a team go on a run because that's inevitable, you know? Yep. Um, the other thing I want to shout out, Trey King is quietly having a really big kind of end of Big 12. He kind of had that breakout game against Kansas. He was our leading scorer against TCU. He's shooting the three ball better. Um, he might be kind of our, we were talking about Dylan Dessou, and I know Trey King probably not as skilled as Dessou, but in terms of being able to beat you multiple ways, I mean, his defense, and then if you really get any production on offense from him, that's just like plus. Yeah. Um, because he's going to be guarding the Emmanuel Miller or the Hunter Dickinson or whoever your best kind of four or probably even five. I mean, Hunter Dickinson is all of, of what, seven, two, seven, three. Yeah. And a filled out seven, three. And Trey King's going to get that defensive assignment every time. Right. So I'm just so impressed by him usually getting the hardest defensive assignment and then turning around and being our leading scorer in the same game. Nuts. So props to him because he's had a huge kind of, what, two, three weeks here of just playing incredible basketball. Yeah, I would say get like the Kansas game being his breakout game, I would say, you know, the whole month of February, he's been pretty good. So I think yeah. just going forward, just keep trying to play that good brand of basketball. And I think it's going to be it's going to be really big for us because I think it helps when Hassan probably can't get it going sometimes offensively to just have that extra Again, that extra weapon of we can hurt you from different ways. Our guards, Milan, and Trey. So, uh, Nigel, I want to ask you this, and I was kind of talking about it with like in, with some friends and some group chats. Let's say we're in a Sweet 16 game. There's two minutes left. It's a tie game. What five players do you want there for Iowa State? Like two minutes, closing stretch. Forget about adjustments. Just like the five guys you trust right now to close a game. Taman, Curtis, Keyshawn, Milan, and for rebound purposes, Rob. It depends on the five matchup, right. but for rebound purposes, Rob. No, I'm with you, and I think Curtis Jones is someone that I wouldn't have thought. I mean, I have basically the same thing with you, and then I'm kind of between, depending on who the other team is, Trey King, if we think we can play small ball. Right. That, and like, again, that's all, it all comes down to matchups. Right. The day, but, and if Hassan yeah. Ward, I think you can kind of rotate between Hassan, Trey King, and Robert Jones, which is a huge luxury. But thinking of Curtis Jones, I'm like, he has to be on the court and to find, like, he, that's not even an, like, that guy's got to be out there. And I wouldn't have thought that maybe even a month ago. So yeah. I think that's, and his free throw shooting is clutch. I think he's a guy that has kind of picked up his production a lot. Uh, in Big 12 play from the three, he struggled in non-conference games. So to have just three really consistent guards, there's been certain guys, and I'm sure you're like this too, whenever they have the ball, I think of Robert Jones, his first year at Iowa State. Anytime he touched the ball, I got nervous. I felt like either a turnover was coming or like I, I just, and there's been certain guards in Iowa State history too where I just like kind of have to like hold my breath when they have the ball. And I feel like right now we have three guards where I feel confident that they're going to take care of the ball. I know we kind of have turnover problems, but it's usually because of good defense. It's not usually self-inflicted. And I think that's just such a big thing to have good guard play in March. And I feel like this is finally a time where we have three guys where I can be like, I trust those guys in the final two minutes. And that's a big, big thing come about a month's time. Yeah. And I think too, like, it's big to – you probably want to start Trey, but, like, Curtis has been that guy as of as of late of, like, the sixth man that, yeah, he's a sixth man, but he's going to end the game. Yeah. So I feel like if he – I feel like he's just embracing that role more. I think he understands what he has to do in the time given him on the floor. And I just think that comes with, you know, the maturity of a season. I feel like if you get to that January and February – Part. If you're a good team, you're probably playing your best basketball just because everyone is aware of what they need to do on the floor because you've gotten enough reps. So, and not just practice reps, but game reps. So, I feel like those that's the most valuable thing you can do is just actually understand what you have to do day in, day out in your role. And I think Curtis, out of everyone, has really like bought into that yeah. and he's seeing the results now. Yeah. And I, there's been a couple guys. Uh, Linda Wigington is a guy who, you know, started. 
I think was it his sophomore year, he was the starting point guard, and then obviously Tyrese Halliburton happens. Yeah, and they started to bring him off the bench, and I felt like Wigginton did a pretty good job of adjusting. You got to remember, he like he was an Oak Hill guy. Like I mean, that guy had been told he was he that was, dude his freshman year with pro right. And then to take a back seat, that's always a tough adjustment. And Curtis Jones was just a leading scorer at his last school, and now he's getting brought off the bench. So it, there is kind of this adjustment period of being like, okay, I'm not the guy, but yeah. how can I still help my team win? I think Curtis Jones has done a great job. Trey King was the guy at Eastern yeah. Kentucky, and he's had to adapt. So I think this team is selfless. I think they're team first guys up and down the roster. And I think that, especially like our defensive brand of basketball, I think you need guys like that that aren't super concerned about their box score stats and they just want to win. Like I think yeah, that's no. kind of the players you need. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think I think you're always gonna find guys like that in the transfer portal because I think the transfer portal kind of creates this uh this desperate not person, but just desperate nature of like these these are a bunch of players that don't like the current situation. Right. And especially if they're a player like a Curtis, like a Trey, who are the guy at the said school, you know, they want to go to it's I it's probably not, oh, I'm not getting enough shots. It's we keep losing. Right. And I, I don't feel fulfilled as a basketball player. It's all of these kids want to play meaningful basketball and they want to win at the end of the day. And I feel like Iowa State is a great platform for that. And I think that's why we've been so successful in the transfer portal um, as of late. Another thing that just kind of going along with this, one of my favorite things about this season has been Keyshawn Gilbert realizing like how cool it is to play for a school that gives a shit about basketball. Yeah. Um, just his reaction well, to Holden. UNLV gave a shit about basketball, but the, the mob ruined that. Right. They, they started yeah. killing people and putting them in trunks. And the wrong take, people. What happened to the game I love, people? <laughs> like that's probably what Keyshawn was thinking when he got to right. Viva Las Vegas, but go on. Tark the Shark kind of uh, took things under down there. They really haven't been. A, I mean, Anthony Bennett, maybe. Yeah. So sorry, UNLV Rebel Girl for all you uh, Twitter Iowa State Cyclones. But I, no, I think like Otz and Keyshawn leaving kind of like like just a toxic kind of program and showing up to a school that, you know, the crowd is filled every night. Keyshawn had never heard a home arena get that loud. I just constantly see him smiling. Like that guy looks like he's just having the time of his life. And well, I feel he like that tweeted, he tweeted yeah. like, I'm having fun. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Yeah. That's so sweet. <laughs> like, and like, that's, that's awesome. That's a great sales pitch to recruits of like, yeah, you can go to these other schools, but is it going to be the environment that you will have in Ames, Iowa every Saturday, you know, on in the best conference in basketball? Like, I think that's just such a great, like, Here's the guy that was at UNLV playing great basketball, but now he's at Iowa State and winning and having fun and fans are, you know, chanting his name. Like, it's just such a cool thing to see. I think that's every kid's yeah. dream is like being in that kind of environment and leading that team. So that's just another, I just, I'm so proud of all these new guys that have kind of just came in and made huge differences to this team. Yeah. But that, it's been awesome to watch and you know, they're a huge part in why we're, undefeated at home still and right. arguably a top team in the country right now so i it's yeah. it's a great time to be a cyclone and i think the new guys are understanding that more than anyone else right now and probably to no uh shock of anyone but there are only three remaining undefeated home teams in the big 12 and it's houston kansas and us so makes sense uh, you know just the big dogs man Makes sense that the best three teams in the conference are the ones that are undefeated at home. But I think it is still interesting. I mean, there's a lot of good teams that have dropped home games. And the longer Iowa State can stay in that category of being unbeaten at home, yeah. I think the better the chances are of a, of a Big 12 title. So that's something to monitor. And then, again, winning any road game is just icing. Well, you talk about icing and you talk about the teams that are undefeated. We do have to play Houston yep. at Houston which I'm not excited about That'd at be all. Tough. But we're going there. We're going to throw a few haymakers and see what happens. So Just see if Kelvin Sampson pisses one down his leg. Dude, uh, I, I, well, now we're on that subject. I need to bring this up because he – Sampson is weird, man. I didn't realize he was just weird because I was always seeing him in the tournament. Like I was not watching American – 
conference games. Like I just I wasn't I wasn't wasting my time with that. We got big boy basketball over here in Ames, Iowa. All right. So you go back to when he played us. Our guy Jake Brent um gets the media que- uh answer from him. I mean, really, it was like a three minute media thing, which yeah, is unlikely. Quite- it's 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 that's not normal from any coach, yeah. and very short, very blunt with his answers, and then I've just seen him lashing out like randomly, and and to the point where like I saw what he was upset about when he got ejected this weekend, but like it didn't seem that right. end of the world scenario, and I'm starting to I, I I look back and I'm like, all right, this is an older guy. Does Coach Sampson have like stage one of dementia? Cause it's just, he's just, he's like kind of not, he's not all there, man. He's not all there. Some of that might just be big 12 basketball. (laughs) Like I really like, I don't know if it's like, I mean, you're playing top 25. I know Oklahoma state's not a top 25 team, but like, like you said, he was used to a two lane, a Southern Florida. You know what I mean? Like he wasn't used to his teams getting the shit beat out of them every single night. Like he was kind of, Houston was always the aggressor in that conference. They were always tougher. They were always bigger and stronger. And now, like, they're playing against guys their size. And he's like, wait, every team can foul like this, not just us? And it's like, yeah, like, we'll we'll punch back. Like, we're not scared to get dirty. And I think he's not used to it. So I, I think at least that's some of it. I don't know if it's all of it, but he seems especially angry lately. I, I guess, man, but it's just like, He's just, that's how you deal with it. <laughs> like know. that's a little adversity hits you, grandpa. And you, you want to start screaming at people. Yeah. He ran, it was a rare, like from out of the camera shot comes Kelvin Sampson storming from the other bench. And oh, I he like, looked like he was checking into the game. Like yeah. I, I thought he had some shorts on. I thought he was ready to play some defense, man. I was like, I was what re- is he doing? That's, I, that is odd behavior. I thought like, Stone Cold Austin's music just hit, and he was like coming in with a steel chair, ready to take some guys out. I, I wouldn't put it past him. Like I, I just feel like, you know, he's used to crossword puzzles and you know yeah. shuffleboard, and this this ain't a cruise ship, buddy. No, it's the Big Twelve. Yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a rock fight in here. Nigel, do you think we have time for at least a quick overview of the DPI? Yes, please. I I I, I want the audience to hear. Okay, you know this thing that you've been so innovative to create. So please so tell the people what started, the DPI is. I, I got a book called Bracketology when I was about 15 or 16, and they kept bringing up the stats of scoring margin, rebound margin, and turnover margin as kind of being the guide of to which teams usually succeed in March, and that can be a 15 seed or a 1 seed. It doesn't – those stats don't care about strength of record or strength of schedule or any of that. It's just three stats to keep an eye on. So I've done that for almost 10 years of looking at those stats for teams. But in the past two to three years, and I want to shout out Levi Stevenson and Danny Brennan because I'm not a spreadsheet guy. Numbers are not my thing. That's why we're in journalism. Right. I I almost went to school exclusively to avoid that kind of thing. Um, But nonetheless, here I am in front of a spreadsheet. So I have... And I'm going to go through it as quick as I can. We got those three stats that I mentioned, all three of those margins. And then I do a lot of Ken Palm. I take their adjusted offense, their adjusted defense, three-point offense, two-point offense, three-point defense, two-point defense, team free throw shooting, offensive effective field goal percentage, defensive effective field goal percentage, and then their ranking in Ken Palm, BPI, and net, and then as well as strength of schedule and strength of record. Just said a lot of words. Basically, what this does to me is show where teams' weaknesses are. You can just kind of like just look at an overview of this spreadsheet, see a really big number, and be like, man, that team's really bad at that. For example, we got Wisconsin, who I was picking on a little earlier. And dude, they are so bad at literally everything. They are bad at scoring margin, or at least unremarkable. They are 89th in in scoring margin. Let me find them. 66th in rebound margin. No, sorry. That's the wrong team. Like I said, bad at spreadsheets. 188 in rebound margin. They're terrible at three-point defense. And what's crazy is you saw this team play Rutgers. 
Yeah. And Rutgers has a great defense. Wisconsin has a terrible offense. They finished with 54 points in that game. Wisconsin did. And Rutgers shot 10 for 17 from the three-point line. So hey, like, shout out to Jeremiah Williams, too, back from injury. He's been yeah, lately. playing good. Um, but that was just like, it's crazy how much numbers can translate to like a real game in real time. Like if I would have looked at those numbers, I could have said Wisconsin's really going to struggle on offense and Rutgers could have a really good day from three point shooting. That is exactly what happened. So nonetheless, DPI, I mean, it's just been something I've been working on. It's an index. So all of these teams have a weighted average. Honestly, it was kind of a bad weekend for the DPI. Auburn is number one in the country. Um, They got blown out by Florida. Tennessee is number three in the country and they lost. But I promise it works more than it doesn't. And it, it works better in March. Practice. I feel like when you right. showed me in March, it was uh it was a lot more accurate with teams like Tennessee and I think yeah. FAU. FAU was so, really good in DPI. Yeah. Virginia so it, was really bad and they lost to Furman right away. Right. Purdue right. was bad and they lost to Fairleigh Dickinson. So it finds these teams' weaknesses and it says, man, a team could exploit that. And more often than not, that's what happens. Yeah. I I got a few. Uh, I got a few friends down here. They they said we're gonna have to do some bracketology, and I feel like we're gonna have to incorporate the DPI within our own bracketology because I feel like it's gonna help. I feel like yeah. I'm gonna have to put some money on this, man. Hey, uh, I think my DPI bracket finished in like the top five percent of all brackets last year. So, and that That's wasn't crazy. even that wasn't the bra- that wasn't my bracket. I just like filled one out exactly as DPI would see it ending. And yeah. to be fair, it's a lot of chalk. It's like a lot of ones and two seeds make the final four. But it's like the ones that aren't fraudulent, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's the ones that analytically don't have many weaknesses and often end up going that far. So Yeah. I have two theories about the tournament. The number one overall seed never wins because the average person who doesn't watch college basketball is going to roll with that team yeah. going, into, going the to win casuals. it all. The casuals. And... Or they're going to pick someone stupid. There's there's two casuals. And then I have a theory in the Final Four that whoever plays, there's two two semifinal games. One game, one team wins by 20. The other game comes down to a game-winning shot or game-clinching shot. The team that plays in the rock fight, dog fight semifinal game is going to lose the national championship, i.e. San Diego State, in North Carolina, just the last two years, just for a, a short example. But yeah. the team who Gonzaga. goes in there, yeah, the team who goes in there and cruises to the national championship, that's your national champion. So, just to give you guys some insight from the last few trends of the the last two years, I don't know if the FBI is going to come and get me, put me in a sack, and you'll never hear from me again. But that's my conspiracy. Also, Taylor Swift is a. Uh, Got the the NFL by the cojones right now, so I, I'm I'm sick. Nigel, let's get into the Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> you were very vocal about your distaste for one Taylor Swift. I'm wondering if Aiden, our producer, is going to come in and, and stop this tirade. But I'm gonna I'm gonna let you. Never fighting up. words. <laughs> hey, man. Let's go. Uh, Wait, what nonetheless, you like, what? Thoughts on the Super Bowl? Obviously, we're both Brock Purdy guys. People forget you're in the same freshman class as Brock Purdy at Iowa State. Junior, junior class, but go, go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, what What did you think of, of the big game last night? Any Any takeaways for you? Man, the game was boring as hell. Like, yeah. the meat and potatoes of the Super Bowl, it was boring as hell. And, like, I going back, I think Usher's performance could have been better. I do like Usher. I love Usher. I loved okay what he did but i think he performed a little too late in his prime i think had he uh, let me give you an example bruno mars had a fantastic super bowl back in 2014 when the seahawks killed the uh, denver broncos i think had usher performed in 2014 he could have played a lot more songs and been just a lot more appeasable to listen to because when i'm i kid you not every song had like 15 seconds that's how many yeah. songs Usher has now being in 2024. But you take 10 years off of his discography and we're sitting at a great Super Bowl show. And then now think about this. You take Bruno Mars, who at the time had only dropped two albums. He now has four under his belt. So think about all the songs he has now. I think he would have been a better this year halftime performance. Right. And then 
you know, I, I was very closeted about this as a child because, you know, it would get you it would get you in a backyard fight at recess. But I was very disappointed not to see Justin Bieber come out with Usher. Like, wow. uh, you know, Usher discovered Justin Bieber and to not have him come out and sing Somebody to Love. I mean, it hurt the soul as a Gen Z man myself. I But to, to go back to the game, very boring game. I was happy of how the San Francisco 49ers pulled it out to a degree. But I feel like with them not knowing the overtime rules, I mean, they just oh. kind of handed the Chiefs another Super Bowl. And it was just very anticlimactic. And the NFL is – it's why I don't watch that crap, man. Like, I don't consistently – I'm not locked in like I used to be because the Russell Wilson beating Peyton Manning, the Eli Manning beating Tom Brady story is dead. People – they want to choose the easy storyline. The easy storyline is – Travis and Taylor smooching after the damn game. We're not even looking at the trophy ceremony. We're just looking at those two going at it. And then why is Ice Spice in Taylor Swift's skybox? Like those two people don't need to be in the same room ever. Ice Spice doesn't know what a first down is. And she's getting hugged on like they just won a ring. What is going on? Uh, Nigel, I'll be the first to say Ice Spice has never been to Kansas City, Missouri. There is, there is not. I, I don't a think chance. she knows what Missouri is. Like uh, Roger Goodell, man, he will do anything for a dollar, and that man will burn in hell for this, for this performance. Oh my god! Oh my god! I can wow, wow, dude. I gotta and then, I, just to see Purdy walk off the field with yeah. like. Man, we really lost to Ice Spice. Like, I could tell that was his inner monologue, man. Because what, bro? Like, the, the the way the Kansas City Chiefs are becoming a reality show cast is pissing me off. I used to like them, but they're slowly becoming the fucking Patriots. Yeah, I think they're doing a heel turn. I think this is like, you know, they just clocked their tag team partner in the face, and now they're, they've gone full Patriots. Like, it's... They're just unbearable. And the other thing I felt the whole game was just this like sense of dread, especially like down the stretch. I was like, I know Mahomes is going to do this. And, and it, it was a slow fun. death. Right. It was a slow death. Right. He wasn't flashy. It was just like mechanical and cold. It looked like Kawhi Leonard taking over a football game. It, it, like you have <laughs> to respect it, but it's like, ah, this just kind of hurts. Right. Like this just, this isn't yeah. fun. And yeah. you know, I, man, the thing is, the NFL, while I don't like it, I know they don't care that I don't like it sure. because here's the thing. I feel the way I feel about the Chiefs now, but there's also a huge community, us, especially us being in Iowa. We're aware of all the Chief fans. Like, I get it. If you're a Chiefs fan, I can't hate you. You know, if your team right. is the one that is picked to be the chosen one, and you know, I, I get it. But it's now got us all in a position where it's like, we're kind of forced to watch because if you're any type of football fan, it's like, okay, I want to watch because I like the Chiefs or I want to watch just to watch them lose. So Roger right. Goodell knows regardless, people are locked in. Yeah. And that's the trap. It's it's not even Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift's the annoying part that comes with it, but it is the fact of like now, okay, people are going to naturally build this resentment to the Chiefs and now it's going to be like the Patriot effect of – Despite me not liking the Patriots, I still watched every Super Bowl. And it's just like, I'm tired of this trap, man. I need to see the little guy win sometimes because yeah. it can get this allegation off people's back. But for the last 10 years, if you go back, yeah. it's been the Patriots. And then they saw Brady was running out of the gas. They're like, all right, who's next in line? Mahomes? Now he's we're going to just milk him until people hate him. And it's like, stop doing this to athletes. These athletes are great people. They're great role models. You don't need to build them up to the point where we just get so sick and tired of them. Let us just naturally appreciate them. It's yep. so annoying. That's the, the one thing that you remind me of is like LeBron James. I feel like like our generation, especially in like middle school and high school, you either loved LeBron like you or yeah. hated yeah. LeBron like me. And but guess what? Hate him or loving, you watched. Yep. And like, that's the trap. That is the that's trap. Yeah. Yep. So uh, it's sick, bro. It's sick. Football could have so much story. There's storylines in anything. Any team that could have made the Super Bowl this year, there was a storyline. The Ravens with Lamar, the yep. Lions, the Lions could have made the Super Bowl. All right. The, the Niners, Brock Purdy, bro. This is a David and Goliath situation right here that yep. could have, you could have 
built. And it would have been a lot more of a fulfilling story going forward because Brock Purdy is just starting out his career. All right. Like the Chiefs can't afford to lose a Super Bowl. All right. And it, it's just like, man, cut it out. Cut it out, NFL. Because I'm not going to watch this horse crap next year. And I'm, I'm, I'm standing on business. David and Goliath would be a lot less interesting a story if Goliath just killed David in like two seconds. Like, you Goliath just the, the on David and like, all right, everyone got to go home now. Huh? Right. I guess that's it. I guess, yeah. uh, I guess that guy's really big and he wins. So. Also, could you imagine? Could you imagine this if Ice Spice showed up to delay David and Goliath? Just Who invited her? Yeah. I, bro, <laughs> I, I hate it. The Super Bowl has become like the the Met Gala slash Grammys now, and it's yeah. like what happened to the game I love. There might be a little too much uh, noise to this. Yeah, I, bro, I agree. it's There's like, a lot going on. Because could you imagine like if like I saw Brock's body language when he walked into the locker room, and I, first of all, I was like, "Damn, it's halftime already," and then also Brock just looked like he wasn't winning in the Super Bowl right now. Like he looked yeah. sad. And it's like, bro, did someone leak the script to that man before the game? Because it just something was off, man. He knew. And it's it's a damn shame that he's got to be this puppet in this this whole charade. Like, yeah. if you want to be a puppet, go join Broadway. Amen. I'm Nigel, sorry. I it's over. We we hit every part. Of, we went biblical. We went to Broadway. We went to <laughs> Ice Spices. We hit every demographic. We went everywhere in that. We hit the Bronx. <laughs> Shout out to Curtis Stinson. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, any parting shots? We got Cincinnati coming up, and then we got a, a big home game against Texas Tech, who's yeah. kind of dropped in the Big 12 standings. But 11 a.m., though. 11 a.m. Yeah. We play great in 11 a.m. games. Big so time. Texas Tech better bring their lunch. I think avoid a trap game at Cincinnati – and take care of business at home. And then we got at Houston, February 19th. Buckle up. That's that's what a, a Monday. big Monday game. Yeah. Big Monday. Bro. They knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing. A happy big Monday to all of you. Nigel, I got nothing else on here. Is there anything you got to say? You thought I was feeling you? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> nice guys. Let them cook. Uh, top 10. We better be top 10. I hope we're top 10. Tell your sons and daughters about the possibly top 10 Iowa State Cyclops. That's all I got. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See Hopefully the AP poll cooks this week. So let's see. Let them cook. Let's go.